It's just something I'll carry with me for the rest of my life. Just nothing else really compared to the two towers. World Trade Center. It was a day like any other. We're shaking it up! September 11th! We'll do a uh, countdown of uh, three, two, one. Only Whatever. this was the day before, the day that would change everything. I remember September 10th saying I would be the next mayor. A city in the sky. These are the World Trade Center towers here. Lives out its last moments. They're coming up to floor 107 to get an experience. And you just don't know they're evil. When he got out of the car, he looked right at us. We looked right back at him. And I said, Mr. Atta, if you don't get right upstairs, you're going to miss your flight. Now, never-before-seen images take us back to the life. We had to use two cameras to get the panorama. And the death of the World Trade Center. And then, of course, September 11th happened. I use 100% agave tequila, cachaça from Brazil. The concept was to have these two spirits dancing together in uh, the cocktail. The pineapple juice adds the froth on the top of the drink. Add the ice, we shake. This was the last cocktail on the September 10th mixology class that I taught at uh, the greatest bar on earth at Windows on the World. I think probably there were 50,000 people in the building at, during any part of the day and 250,000 people transiting through the World Trade Center during the course of a business day. And to me, it was like being the mayor of, of a small town, and maybe not such a small town. If you think of 250,000 people, you know, you're talking about something like Providence, Rhode Island.
The number of artists that actually work directly with some of the office people and the corporate space. You know, one group of artists had, they employed 10 floors of the building or so and had different people put shades down so it spelled out a word. You could actually really feel the movement of the, of the building at times, uh, but the most uh, incredible thing was the sound of the wind. And the wind became like a, like not a person, but it was an entity, it was there. It was there all the time and, and you could feel it, you could hear it. I never liked staying there alone. It was a very spooky place. I loved it. I thought it was amazing. It was raw, very dry. You could see all the insulation on the beams above. There was all these empty office spaces, and that's just fun to like go through it and see if you could find stuff. My work is not really about commerce, but it's definitely about um, a bustling city and just endless images and endless lines and shapes and sort of this controlled chaos of the city. So you really felt that there with all the commuters going down to the path trains and, and, uh, and jam-packed in the elevators. I remember reading a description of the World Trade Centers before we moved in that they were like IBM punch cards, that kind of rigid geometry. I think really our first impressions were that this was sort of a very difficult building to work in. Just this huge rabbit warren of, of offices. Floors were actually perfect from a real estate point of view. They were each one acre with a center core and no columns. So it really allowed people to do um, whatever they really chose to do with their space. Cantor Fitzgerald was a special case because the Cantor family owned the largest Rodin collection, private collection in the world. When I first went up to the Trade Center, I uh, came off the 105th floor, and there was the monumental thinker. I mean, that 12-foot thinker sitting in the lobby, and you're thinking, holy moly, how did they get this here? It was breathtaking. Working at Windows on the World, there was nothing or at no place that you can work and go up from there literally and, and figuratively. It kind of reminded me of the entertainment business where the people would come here and uh, it was like the experience began as you entered the elevator. What was remarkable about Windows on the World was a journey up to the bar because you had to take two elevators, you had to switch on one floor to get up to 107. It was a beautiful elevator. It was uh, granite and carpeted and brass and smoked mirrors. And you look up and it takes a second to realize how many floors are just whipping by. And then when you start seeing three digits with every floor that you would go up, your expectations would go up as well. Then when the doors open and you step outside into the, well, not just the hallway, but the promenade, uh, there wasn't just light fixtures, there were light sculptures. There wasn't just carpeting, there was custom-made carpeting using these great patterns of actual street grids of 16 major cities of the world. So you experience all of this with every step. It was very unique. There was nothing else like it in Manhattan or the world. I was the head bartender. I was striving to have signature cocktails, and the inspiration for those came from the actual views that you can see from the windows. Uh, there was the Lady Libertini. Then there was the other view of the three bridges crossing over the East River. 
So I did the three bridge brandy punch and that was uh, meant for sharing. There was a lot of business deals being closed and celebrated. All of this together were elements that combined to create this environment. So it wasn't just one thing. I mean, the entertainment was one aspect of it, but the food and the drinks, uh, the mixology, and this way to approach entertainment. They wanted to create something high-end, and I, I believe they achieved it. The notion of the World Trade Center itself being a target was not off the table. But there had been enough time elapsed, eight years or so, between the first attack and the one that brought the towers down, that I think, you know, people, they put their guard down. One of the first things the Port Authority took me to see was the area where uh, the, they had brought the van and exploded the explosives down in the parking level. And it, it was very sobering, you know, to, to see it. And then I was told when they took the blind sheik away in the helicopter after he was arrested, he vowed that they would come back and, and finish what they started. Well, most people complain that their driver's license pictures don't look like them. Otters look like him. He was an unlikable guy who made a habit of being rude. That's what the picture is. I mean, it's him. I think Otto was misanthropic. I think he hated people. Two individuals had come in to the front window counter and they had placed an order for a medium thin crust veggie lovers pizza. I treated them like any other customer, utmost respect, greeted them, thanked them for their business and sent them on their way as efficiently as is possible. You can look evil in the face and you don't realize it until something big happens and it has that connection with you. It sucks. It sucks. It was a rededication of a firehouse that had been there almost 100 years. So many of the firehouses in New York City were in disrepair. We did not have the resources to tear them all down or remodel all of them. I had been fire commissioner since uh, 1996, so in 2001, it was almost six years. It was nearing the end of Giuliani's term. He's got him, he's got him done. He's going to hit on to well, I'll give the cameras time and we'll do a uh, countdown of uh, three, two, one, when everybody's in uh, position. Cameras all ready? Three, two, one. Both of these companies and to all of our firefighters, you perform the most valued service in the city of New York. You're also the most respected profession in the city of New York and you deserve to be. Thank you very much. People who are here remember, Giuliani fatigue had set in uh, pretty much by that time, uh, both in his, his political life and his personal life. I don't really care about politics right now. It seemed like things were kind of going off the tracks and that he was winding his term down at just the right time because people were ready to move on. My family, the people that I love, and uh, what, 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 what's the, what can be done that's honest and truthful and that protects them the best. When the city was ready to move on beyond Giuliani, all the peoples of the city, I, I thought that that might be me. You know, often in, in history, a, a successor is different than the, than the person leaving office. And so there was a certain historical logic that I was in a position to succeed Giuliani and his too often racially divisive approach had created a certain anger and weariness. So his poll ratings were like Nixon's. 
There was a lot of momentum. The campaign was optimistic, and you could sort of feel that at the events. You know, every party, every parade, uh, every meet and greet on the street, it just got more and more exciting, and uh, it seemed to grow exponentially. Um, and so my only goal as, you know, a 17-year-old kid with a little camera was to capture that excitement. Come out and vote. I think the eeriest aspect is that we say September 11th with glee. It was something we were looking forward to. Um, for months, we were like, can't wait till September 11th. We're taking it back. We're out of Clinton power. We're shaking it up. September 11th. I want to be the Democrat who is a bridge. You could use the Twin Towers as a metaphor back then. You could use Ground Zero as a metaphor. Ground Zero of Democrat USA Looking back on it now, it's sort of shocking to hear, but they were just, they were just things he said. We come to this house this morning to celebrate renewal. The uh, FDNY had several chaplains Father George was one of them, and he was probably the hardest working chaplain that we had. Someone who became very close to our members because he would, he would always be there uh, when, when something happened. Uh, good things, bad things, horrible things. You do what God has called you to do. You show up, you put one foot in front of another, you get on the rig, and you go out, you do the job, which is a mystery and a surprise. You have no idea when you get on that rig, no matter how big the call, no matter how small, you have no idea what God's calling you to. I never remember him saying before, when you get on the rig, the fire truck, that you never know whether you're gonna come home or not. And we all know that, but to hear him say it, you know, it, always, it, it resonated. A difficult, difficult job, and God calls you to it, and then he gives you a love for it, so that a difficult job will be well done. The sacrifices that you make in giving so much to strangers, those were all words that became so meaningful to all of us. Turn to him each day, put your faith and your trust and your hope and your life in his hands, and he'll take care of you, and you'll have a good life. Be proud and be grateful for all that you have, because when you get on that rig, you never know if you're gonna come back. Amen. She was very special in the sense she played hard and she worked hard. She, you know, ended up at the top of Tower One just by sheer uh, will and uh, never giving up. I think Marissa was very proud of where she worked and she was very proud of me and I was very taken that how much she cared about what I did. So it was like this, this thing that was like back and forth, you know, giving to each other. She was very wise and personable and basically just was very smart and she knew how to get things done. There'd be times where I wouldn't see Marissa for you know, a couple of months, because as you do with brothers and sisters, especially you could be living in the same city and go months without seeing each other. September 10th was my mom's birthday. Marissa called me and said, what do you want to do for mom's birthday? And I said, well, whatever you want to do, I'm here, I'm in the city, so just tell me and I'll meet you there. And she said, mom wants to go to Windows on the World in Tower One, because, you know, she loves it. She, it makes her feel like she's on top of the world especially that her daughter and son could take her to the top of Tower One. As soon as you start coming over on the boat, you know, you're looking around, but just nothing else really compared in the skyline to, to the two towers. Coming from a bit of a prairie town in Canada, you can't help but go, wow. It's really quite ominous. And certainly, you know, being traveler, 
you want nice, bright, sunny days. But uh, I also love photography and love taking pictures, and so I decided to, to take a couple pictures to kind of capture this storm coming in, and it really felt kind of dramatic. The observation deck, unfortunately, was closed just because it was windy and raining. I think there's one picture of, of me standing against the windows. It's just something I'll carry with me for the rest of my life. I shot this footage the afternoon of September 10th. I was starting my second week of classes at NYU, and so it was one of those situations where we were all just kind of had random schedules where we could just meet up at any point of the day, and so we kind of always left our door open, and our friends who lived in our dorm would just pop in and out and sit around and chit-chat. Why? Back in time where the most important thing to me was convincing my friend that I had a cool life and that I had fun friends and making fun of myself for having peanut butter and ramen in my cupboard and you know and that's it. And so it's just there's no stress connected to it. There is no like nothing bad was happening. September 11th happened and all of a sudden none of that really mattered to me. I would never kind of look at my life again the same way. I wondered why they went to Portland for years, and I actively investigated it for months and never got a reasonable answer, other than the, the, the most frequently suggested reason is that perhaps Ada thought that he would lessen his exposure to airport security by going through a smaller airport, when in fact we know he doubled his exposure to security. I think going to Portland was just a simple mistake. I think he just screwed up. I think these guys screwed up repeatedly, and this was one of the bigger ones. So I checked him in like I normally would, and the, the name on the driver's license was Muhammad Atta. So I was like, punched in all the other information, and gave him his keys, and off he went. He just looked normal. There was no deep thought of committing mass murder or whatever. Didn't see evil. Just a normal person checking in. But all in all, I think we're going to have a real mixed bag of a day. Starting out with clouds, maybe peaks of sunshine, and then uh, we're going to really cloud up later on in the afternoon. That well, September 10th started out with a lot of rain. I had my Spirits in the Sky box seminar that evening, so I found the biggest umbrella that I could, got to the car, turned the key, nothing. Would not start. Turned it again, not even a click. So this is not what I needed. Wow, we that's a cool shot. Wow, we sounded kind of stupid, but uh, it really is uh, partly cloudy. I was the person 
running the seminar. I was the host. I can't be late, let alone absent. I actually had to take a cab from Hackensack, New Jersey, to the World Trade Center. It was a gray, humid, heavy day. But we went with full expectation of doing our work. And uh, we did begin doing our duet. But sort of marking because it was about space and sound and clarity for the stagehands when we came in or where we went off or any of those things. And that's when it, it absolutely poured. And then this, this sudden amazing amount of rain that came down and our stage manager says, you know, well, thank you, that's it, no more. Then I seem to recall the rain was sort of steady, unremitting, remorseless. It was just incredible. On September 10th, I arrived around noon, went upstairs. There was no one there, started working. But I believe Monica was there. She had the cameras out the window, so she was there. In my work, I try to use uh, elements in the landscape that are recognizable by other people, so there's already a language there that is defined. What am I looking at? Well, why is it moving like that, and so on and so forth. So, I don't know why I thought, wouldn't it be great to have a studio at the World Trade Center where I can be above everything and have all these crowds like passing by every moment? <laughs> so I will go there and film, and I told everybody, I want to film the view, and I need some clouds. But I kept on going that summer, and there were no clouds. And I was very disappointed at that, too. Mm, thunder showers, I think, uh, let's say between 4 and 8 o'clock, roughly. It could be a few hours earlier and a few hours later. It lasted for several hours, and I was getting this amazing footage. I had always been scared of thunderstorms, like really terrible thunderstorms. And I would be like underneath a chair and screaming. But that day something really happened. I just felt like I was protected. So we're fine. We're not going to die from <laughs> thunder. Um, and I just thought that it was beautiful just to see the whole sky open this beautiful blue and then, you know, close again. We found that we were surrounded by this little thunder and lightning storm. So I went right up to the window and you're, you know, you're an inch away from the outside. We were inside the thunderstorm. There was lightning around us and all these different colors of the clouds. When the lightning would, um, you'd get this, uh, these glowing, these glows and you'd see the colors. And it was, uh, it was beautiful. It was really exciting. You were sort of in this maelstrom, but you were surrounded by silence at the same time. It was crazy out there today, Nikki. Well, we had a little cold front come through with some thunderstorms. <laughs> well, you know, on and off. Perspective feet, of things. My feet are still wet. September 10th, I went all the way uptown to a Japanese restaurant called Neo on the Upper West Side uh, because my brother, who also worked at Cannon Fitzgerald, wanted me to go uh, to this restaurant. And, and then we were going to the Michael Jackson concert, which was in Madison Square Garden. 
One of the different aspects of the party on September 10th at Windows in the World was that I went solo. And that night in particular, which was rare, I was singing by myself. It's remarkable that everything changed a few hours later. But that night and that day was a very normal day. It was about 5 o'clock. The elevator doors opened. The greeters were there already working. I started walking towards uh, my room that, I, that was being prepared for the, for the seminar. A lot of people don't realize it wasn't just one restaurant. On the way to the Windows on the World restaurant, if you would stop and look to your right, there'd be a smaller dining area, and that was called Cellar in the Sky. The wine cellar had over 60,000 bottles. The wine menu always had at least 700 bottles. So we had a wine book, not just a wine menu. So I remember the elevator opens and there's all this amazing wine in this glass case, and you're like, whoa, this is going to be good. The person that was going to seat us was not happy that I was wearing corduroys. I said, what's the big deal? And I mean, I was dressed nice. It's just that I was wearing black corduroys. And uh, he said, no, it's a dress code. And my sister said, no, no, this is not going to happen. So she took him aside and had a few words with him and uh, made sure that that wasn't going to be an issue. And uh, we walked in. She never told me what she said to him, though. So. But that's the kind of person she was. And we sat on the circular table right by the window. And she ordered a bottle of wine that was over $200. And I tasted it. And it was the best wine I ever tasted. It was amazing. So I said, great, OK, we're going to have this bottle. And then she'll probably go down to like some regular priced wine. No, she wanted another bottle of the same one. And I was like, are you crazy? You know, this is it's so expensive. The bill's going to be so high. She's, she's like, no, you know, she's like, tonight we're, you know, don't worry about it. I remember, you know, it's like a memory of a memory of a memory of a memory. Sometime after five or six, Michael showed up, said hi to him. He started working. So we were both working simultaneously. I remember he took a mattress or a sleeping bag and put it on top of his table, because that's where he was going to sleep. He had to work the next morning at the Bronx Museum. I said, I'll see you later. And he said, yeah, I'll see you later. And that was it. So how do you feel? I, I think I'm getting a little tense. I, I don't know how to feel. This is a September 10th. We were having our little chicken dinner at, at home. No one thinks you're going to get 40, and you're definitely not going to run against Type C. Sort of going over um, what had happened so far. Exactly what we wanted. He never got off message. I remember the night of September 10th. I felt reasonably confident I would be the nominee and the next mayor. You never know. Unless there was some big external event that could knock everything for a loop. The night of September 10th, I turned to Denny and I said, well, there's been no external event. And that night, at around midnight, a lot of the staff came over picked us up, and we, were, we spent the next few hours driving around the city, uh, putting up posters. And we were putting up posters until like 5 AM. When I got back, Dad was just waking up. I was beat, but we couldn't go to sleep. I, we had to go vote. martini. The first ingredient will be one and a half ounce of vodka.
Now, if you want to make a really good sour apple martini, it's always great to include fresh juices. So I'm going to add half an ounce of fresh squeezed lemon juice. Now we add the ice. The seminar in the, the skybox on September 10th was primarily tequila. It was uh, a tequila tasting, and the people were great. They all participated. They were enthusiastic. If the seminar ends at 7.30, I was usually out by 8.15. At this time, it was probably closer to 8 when we finished, and somehow the sky cleared. The city was just glistening. You could see every light. And the visibility must have looked like 20 miles away. It was so special of an evening, I ended up staying after the seminar. We all went into the greatest bar on earth, and the band was playing. I ended up ordering champagne for everyone. I sat down and ate and enjoyed myself with everyone that attended the seminar. They're coming up to floor 107 to get an experience, so you better be ready for some fun. And I'd always play music uh, as a DJ that would really draw them in and make them dance. I was about 12.30, and I left. And I remember hearing my mom say, to my sister, why don't you, like literally said, why don't you take off tomorrow? You're working so much. She said, I can, I have a meeting at 8.30. For some reason, it just stuck in my mind. It was a special night. It was something that I'll always remember. One thing that I did forget that night was that I did not have my car with me. And then when I looked at my watch again, and it said 1.30 in the morning, it just dawned on me that I have no way of getting home. We're coming up on the Statue of Liberty now on the starboard side of the ship. I didn't want to, but I had to call my wife, who was home sleeping with my 11-month-old baby. And I said to her, I hate to do this to you, but you have to come get me. She took my baby out of her crib, put her in her car seat, and uh, drove into New York to come get me. These are the World Trade Center towers here. So something wanted me to just show my daughter. So I took her out of the car. And I held her, and I said, look, Genevieve, that's where Daddy works, way up there. I don't even know if she knew what she was looking at, but her eyes were like saucers. And one thing I'll never forget is just seeing the two towers reflecting in her big brown eyes. You run across evil people throughout your whole life, and you don't know they're evil until something happens. Tuesday, September 11th, was like any other morning. I was working the front desk as a night auditor and was checking people out. This room came down to be checked out name was Mohammed Atta. He gave me the room number of 233, and I pulled up the information and checked him out and sent him on his way to the airport or wherever he was going. OK, thanks. Bye. Go ahead. This is Chopper 4. OK, copy that. Thank you. Shot right here. My memories of work on September 11th, I don't remember as being particularly any different from any other typical work day. Yeah, talk about a rough ride this morning. Let's go down to 1 and 9 and show you what we mean. Check out this huge hole in the road. A partial road collapse happened here sometime overnight. It's almost like you're looking at our faces, the reporters' faces, and it's almost like you're seeing 
faces that in a way would never be that way again. I was gonna take September 11th off because it was gonna be a special day. We've had a few elections in the family, so elections sort of became a family tradition, like a holiday. And we stayed up all the way until 7 a.m. to vote. And, you know, at 7 a.m., we're uptown, I'm with my family, and there are a dozen news cameras in front of us. Like, we're, we were what was happening that day. Can you drop them off and I go to a bowling place? Yes, sir. Uh, but I felt great. We took the car and went to vote at a school about three blocks from our home, where I spoke to a scrum of reporters saying everybody should vote today. It's our day, it's democracy. When they came from Portland to Boston uh, and found out that they were going to have to check in again, Otto became worried about his luggage and whether it would make the flight or not. What we don't understand about these guys is that they were not exceptional individuals. People screw up everything. And these guys are no different. They screw stuff up. You know, they expose themselves to security they shouldn't. Uh, they almost miss flights. But they didn't need to be perfect to do this. All they had to do was be better than the security that they defeated. Well, the morning of 9-11 seemed to be a pretty normal morning. Uh, we started off, we did our first flight. In the morning, they have flights that are called kickoff flights. And we worked our first trip. And then there was an off schedule, uh, a flight canceled, or a crew got tied up somewhere. So that's when we got um, assigned to flight 11. At the time, we were on a very, very company-imposed on-time departure kick. I mean, everything absolutely positively had to leave on time. The last bags come through, and we get the final bag sheet. That means that we can now lock the airplane up, meaning that we're ready to go on the ground. And there were two transfer bags from um, US Airways that had come from Portland, Maine. And I looked at the name underneath it, it just had the letter M slash A-T-T-A, -T -T M Otta. We had a little bit of a discussion, and my decision was that I'm gonna follow the rules that the company has instituted, and it's 10 minutes before departure, I can't take any more bags and open up the aircraft. So what I did was I just refused the bags. After the jet bridge pulls off, now the aircraft is ready to be dispatched, which is being pushed off into a taxiway. And the guy in the headset said, you're, you know, basically you're all set. The plane is yours. The guy grabs the pin out of the plane, which was myself. The pilot, John Aganowski, happened to be from my town that I live in. And, you know, I knew of him, but I never actually met him. I can clearly remember him waving his hand and waving me off after I saluted him. One was a medieval monastery in southern Germany.
another one was the, uh, the TV tower uh, in Berlin, which is also very iconic, similar to the Empire State Building. And the third one was a view, a friend of mine had this beautiful view in Brooklyn of Lower Manhattan with the East River and the bridges and the World Trade Center. So we, we had to use two cameras to get the panorama. So we started uh, recording it on September 9th. You could call it a time lapse, but I kept it in real time. So it becomes a strange hybrid between a, a still image, because you have like five seconds time to scan it and uh, take it in, and then it, it changes. It makes for a different experience. And then, of course, uh, September 11th happened, the whole skyline changed. Good morning to you, everybody. Let's oh, back it off. <laughs> Let's look outside right now. 8.09 is the time. Uh, I'm told 64 degrees is the temperature. <laughs> and as I was walking to get coffee, someone else said it's nice outside. So let's, let's pass that along to you. Things looking fine. Well, the morning of September 11th was one of those perfect autumn days. And I got to breakfast a little bit early. Ordinarily, I would not have had been having breakfast with Liz Thompson, my guest that morning. She was involved with the art program. And so, uh, you know, at, at about 8.15, Liz arrived. And as I was talking to her, I realized that my mind was starting to wander. And I recall looking down at my watch, and it was 8.40. And I said to Liz, Liz, I am embarrassed. I've never done this before. I need to end breakfast now and to reschedule with you because I've got to see somebody um, early in the day, and the only window I have to do it is now. We then went down to the Sky Lobby, which was on 78, and ordinarily I would have said goodbye to there and then proceeded back up to my office on 88, but I was so um, self-conscious about uh, uh, cutting our breakfast short, I said to Liz, why don't we just go down to the lobby and let me say goodbye to you formally in the lobby. We were probably in the lobby no more than 15 or 20 seconds when the plane hit. And I found out later um, that we were on the last elevator to leave Windows on the World and come down to the lobby. My father was a golfer, and he, he taught me to understand the sound of when a golf club hits the ball absolutely smack like that. And I, I knew that sound very well. And as I was standing at the window in the studio, I heard that sound. That something has hit its mark absolutely bang on. We were both sound asleep, and, and we heard just like a boom, and we both shot out of bed, and we lived and had two beds next to each other, and we just both popped up. Oh my God! And so it took us a second to decide to look out the window to see what all the commotion was about. I love how like daily life just continues. Yeah. So usually I would come to the office at around eight o'clock in the morning. And September 11th was a special day because it was my son Kyle's first day of kindergarten. So my wife Allison and I decided to take him to his first day of school. So we took a picture right outside the building. 
It's about 8.46 in the morning, because there's a timestamp on the photograph. And then my phone started ringing. That's such an arbitrary Florida bomb. Maybe it was just like a mistake. You know, like maybe it was just something that blew up. I heard uh, screaming and static and, you know, and something about the World Trade Center. And I was still sleeping. And I woke up and I said, I have to be dreaming because this, did he just say the World Trade Center? A plane hit the World Trade I was just there, you know, I was just literally left there and went to sleep. And now I'm waking up and they're saying a plane hit the World Trade Center. I can't believe we're standing here watching this. There's like paper floating everywhere, it looks like. It's so I pop up and I go to the TV and I see, boom, the second plane hits. And then we knew. Oh my God! What do we do? We have to I don't know! I don't know! After I was told the, that a plane had hit the building, uh, I, I didn't know what that meant. So I just ran down, I got in my car, and uh, I have a retired police officer as my driver. And so we went right to Fifth Avenue and went straight down Fifth Avenue. So as you get downtown, you could see the World Trade Center. And, Obviously, I, I, as soon as I could see it, I could see a uh, billowing smoke pouring out of the uh, the building which had my the uh, antenna on it, which of course was our floors. And uh, and I said, let's just get there, let's just get there. My driver started crying. Those people at the top are just doomed. I knew it. Knowing how hard the journey was to get up from the lobby of World Trade Center number one, all the way up to floor 107, knowing how long that took, knowing that there really was no way out. I mean, there are stairs, but you're gonna, you know, take a stairs uh, 107 floors down when a plane hits. It's just pandemonium on the streets. What, what would make them think that they could drive? I ran to the building and started grabbing people as they came out of the doors, asking what floor they were on. So all I wanted was just one person from my floors and grab them. And so I was asking people what floor they were on. And the highest floor I got to was the uh, 92nd floor when I heard this roar. And then it just starts to fall. And I just turn around and I start asking, did it, I said, did the World Trade Center just fall? And everyone's saying, yeah, yeah. I was, I literally just like laid down in the street and I started crying. I was like, because I knew there's no way she got out of there. Oh my God! Oh my God! Meg, just hang on. No. no. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. Oh my God. Shut the window. Oh. And I just remember thinking, if I could just turn a corner and just see her sitting on a curb or something, I would just hug her and like never let her go. And it's just. That was the one time I really knew how important it was to always make sure that people that are around you know that you love them. Oh. oh, my God. So I started running, and if I had run to the left, I'd, I'd run into it and die. So for no reason, I, I just run to the right. And, uh, and as I'm running, I look over my shoulder, and there's a tornado of black smoke chasing me. And then I, uh, I dive under a car, and the Black smoke engulfs me. Oh my God! So I'm out of the city. Look at that! I mean, look at that! People running. <laughs> By the time I had gotten to work, I walked in the door. I looked down the hall. Here comes my news director, a veteran, a very tough cookie of a newswoman who'd seen it all. She has tears streaming down her face. Her voice is shaky. She can barely talk, and she said that that the, the first tower to fall had come down. We have been no, absolutely it's, consumed it's still by smoke of death. I, go I, I wish somebody would tell us what to do. Can you see anything? No, you can't see anything. I'm going to turn this off. With that as, as the backdrop, I went out and took my seat and began talking about this, this event and basically stayed there talking about it for the next four days.
I saw Father Judge in the early stages of the tragedy. I don't remember exactly when. I, I think it was probably after the second plane hit. I looked over and I saw him, and it, it looked like he was mumbling or speaking to himself. I realized he was praying, and I thought he was probably saying the rosary because he had his hands together. And he was watching the firefighters running up the stairs. When the south tower fell down, debris blew through into it and hit him in the back of the neck. So he was the only one in that group of five or six uh, people who was killed at that moment. So the firefighters there picked him up, carried him outside, they realized he was dead, and brought over to St. Peter's Church. You show up, you put one foot in front of another, you get on the rig, and you go out, you do the job, which is a mystery and a surprise. You have no idea when you get on that rig, no matter how big the call, no matter how small, you have no idea what God's calling you to. It was such a blow to think that that, that could be, that Father Judge was gone. It was the beginning of, of something that just got worse and worse and worse. The crazy thing is, is I woke up in the morning after the first plane had hit, and I had these messages on my machine, panicked messages from my dad. You know, Jeffrey, something's happening at the World Trade Center. Where are you? Are you there? Well, my girlfriend at the time thought I might have slept over. It was She was going through hell. And I went to my window. I was in Brooklyn in Williamsburg, and my windows faced south so I could see it out of my window, I could see this zigzag of smoke in the air. And I was thinking about Michael, and I kept being like, put it out. Get up there, where's the sprinklers? You know, put out the fire. So I was worried about Michael. I wanted them to put the fire out and just end this, and it just wasn't happening. And I ran up to the roof of my building, and I just let out this like primal scream, like just happened. I was, and uh, then I went back downstairs and cried for six months. from the biggest deal in my life was being embarrassed that I only had peanut butter in my cupboard to not having a place to live, being worried that there was going to be another terrorist attack that night. And, you know, worried, did any of my classmates that had internships die? Like, that's really what I was concerned about, um, just, you know, in the blink of an eye. airplane so much. People use the expression that week that sounds callous, but they're saying, wow, that was just like, it was like, it looked like a scene from a movie. That sounds so shallow, but on the other hand, it's only the movies that you expect to see things like planes flying into high rises and then, you know, Godzilla knocking over buildings and, you know, you know, good versus evil played out on such a large scale.
There was a writing ledger that had a lot of Arabic writing on it. I didn't know what it was. Uh, there was a buck knife. There was a can of pepper spray or mace. Then we opened up the green bag. That's something I'll never forget. Inside that was um, some of the most perfectly immaculate pressed clothes that I'll, I'll ever see. A shirt with a tie perfectly on the neck like that. I, it was absolutely immaculate. So why would not have all that stuff in his luggage on the day that he's going to commit mass murder? It was a way of destroying the evidence of, that he was involved. All the stuff, that he, the valuable documents of his life were all gathered in one place, and they were going to burn along with him. Democratic mayoral front runners were among the first to the polls this morning. Mark Green voted on the Upper East Side. After voting, my group went to the very, very last event of the campaign as intended. Well, Green has shown himself to be a very good public communicator. Um, and at 845, we all said to ourselves, that's it, the last handshake. When an educator I know was walking by, she looked up and went, huh? It isn't easy being green. I rarely speak about what 9-11 did to my family and me. It sounds so small. Tens of thousands were grieving because they knew those who died. Millions became less secure in their own lives. I wish we had a better result for you to cheer. Uh, the reality, though, is five to six people have come up to me and said, I was so excited to vote for you uh, that I didn't go to work on time, but I went to the polling place to make sure I voted early. And so I wasn't on the 85th floor of the World Trade Center when the plane hit. So someone would call, a widow would call me up on the phone and say, how are you? And I'd say, I suck. How are you? And they'd laugh. And I'd say, see, 23 hours, 59 minutes, and 45 seconds stunk today those 15 seconds you left, so it's a rally. I got to admit, there was an absolute sense of, of uselessness. You really had nothing to do um, or to help, because there was no way to, to make um, a dent. Basically, we were going to harness the light of a particular colony of this naturally illuminating organism and amplify that and put it on the radio mast so everyone in New York and the surrounding boroughs could see it. It was going to be like a sort of monster, if you will, on top of the building blinking this very organic, strange sort of um, uh, communication. In a way, rewriting the King Kong story. Um, but we wanted to update it a little. Okay, the first step to make the La Rumba cocktail is you have to prepare the glass. 
and uh, any cocktail glass uh, like this would, would be fine. You want to start to a year uh, after the rim September 11th. Glass. We were approaching the one year anniversary and my wife was expecting our second baby, my son. And his due date was September 11th, 2002. Now I'm dipping the glass in coconut sugar. You can also use sugar in the raw or a demerara. Okay, so the next we did not want his birthday to be September 11th. So we actually went in early and we had my wife induced so he was born on September 9th, 2002, and we brought him home on September 11th. And to me, that was probably one of the best gifts I could have gotten because not only did I get my, my son, but I got the most beautiful diversion from that date that will help me through September 11th for the rest of my life. Just last week, someone showed me an interview that I gave in November of 2001, when uh, the, the media was still questioning the promises we made. We had offered 25% of our profits for the next five years and suggesting 25% of nothing was nothing. When I said in November that I am happy to be judged, and so Cantor Fitzgerald has, has really lived up to each and everything that we've said. And, and we did that because it was the most important thing in not only in my life, but each and every person at Cantor Fitzgerald, it was the most important thing in their life to take care of our friends' families. This happened because we weren't good enough to stop it from happening. And more than that, it could happen tomorrow. I don't think there's a substantial difference in security now than there was then. I mean, it's probably maybe harder to get enough hijackers into the country to do it. Uh, but, you know, I'm not sure of that even. I was three blocks away at the Boston Marathon when you heard those blasts, everybody stopped. Everything went silent. There was thousands of runners right after the fact. Everything went silent and everybody looked in the direction and it was silent for a few seconds and then everyone just started buzzing. We didn't know what it was. And I saw the same look on everybody's eyes. What's so important about September 10th, 2001, it's really critical to reset us back to that date. There are 
human eyewitnesses who will tell you their story as their experience enables them to reconstruct it. And then there are artifacts that are eyewitnesses and artifacts don't particularly have politics. You know, they don't have agendas. The police delivered her bag to the door and it was charred. It was covered in dust and soot but the inside was in perfect condition and her wallet was in there. But my mom didn't open it, she left it in there. So then about six months later after that, the museum called and said, we know that they found this bag and would you be interested in letting us use it at the museum? So they were very, very nice. They sent a car for us and we brought the bag. So we opened it together and inside the pocketbook was her wallet and the bill from the night before, from 9-10. After a while, time heals, but you just really miss the person, you know? That one night, I remember saying, when I woke up from the first night of trying to sleep, after the day after 9-11, I said, well, now I know what the worst day of my life feels like because that was the worst. Seeing my mom like that, seeing the world like that, seeing, you know, just everything. Trying to get through the night until the sun comes up just because you don't want it to be dark, you know, it's like... So anyway, that's it. Right up until 9-10, news people everywhere, certainly in New York, would always have discussions about what was the biggest story you ever covered. And you would talk about, oh, this, this, uh, you know, this prison escape that took place years back. There was this disaster that took place here. After 9-10 and 9-11 had happened, that discussion is no longer held. Nobody talks anymore about what the biggest story they've ever covered is because we all know the answer now. Hope it stays the answer.